Hi everyone, welcome to the Sleep and Dementia series part two. This is Shweta Tiwari. I'm an assistant professor, Department of Geriatrics, Nova Southeastern University. I'm also the administrative director for the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program, a federally funded grant through HRSA. This presentation is supported by the grant funding from HRSA and the principal investigator is Dr. Nashira Pandya. Affiliations and disclosures, I have no conflicts. Learning objectives, the two important learning objectives I'm going to cover through this presentation are, one, we are going to understand the different strategies which can help improve sleep. And I'm also going to summarize the caregiver sleep study results which we completed a few years back. As I discussed in my previous presentation, Sleep and Dementia Series Part 1, I am going to refer to persons with dementia as PWD for the sake of convenience throughout the presentation. I had also discussed how illnesses such as Alzheimer's disease, which can cause dementia, disrupt sleep patterns. There are additional changes in the brain chemistry, which can interfere in getting deep uninterrupted sleep. Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia also impact the PWD's ability to think clearly and remember things. And because of this, the PWD may be confused, they may wake up multiple times at night, they may be upset, and they may wander. And all this can increase the stress and anxiety levels of the caregiver. So what can we do to improve the sleep of the, P of the PWD? Now, there are multiple things which are cited in the literature, and we're just going to talk about some of them. Reducing napping time during the day. Now, this is very essential. If we reduce the napping time of our loved ones during the day, it may help the PWD to feel tired and sleep early. Consistent bed and rising time will also help. Now, some of you may have noticed that the PWD may wake up multiple times during the night. It is important to explore what are the reasons behind these awakenings. Is it incontinence? Is it anxiety? Are they looking for someone? Are they thinking this is daytime and they might have to go to work? So it is important to figure out what these awakenings are and what, what is causing them so that we can reduce them and then they can sleep better. It is also important to figure out that what is occupying the PWD's brain. If it helps, write it down so that we can speak to the specialist when we meet with them next time. In the next few slides, we are going to discuss some other elements which can help the PWD sleep better exercise and impact on sleep. We want all older adults, including PWDs, to exercise. Why? Because it reduces boredom, increases muscle strength, reduces risk for falls, and is also associated with better sleep and mood. It is recommended that everyone should ideally exercise 30 minutes a day. Now, this 30 minutes doesn't have to be continuous. You can do 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, and 10 minutes in the evening, especially for people who are frail or unaccustomed to physical activity should start slowly building this up. So break your exercise time into chunks throughout the day. And again, we should talk with the doctor if we have any concerns about starting an increased activity program. Now, exercise is important to sleep better, and it is easier to talk about it. But how do we implement it? And yes, that is a challenge. Experts suggest that establishing a routine does help. I'm going to talk about some of the suggestions which have been cited by the literature, which can help establish a routine. The best way to set up an exercise or physical activity routine is to do something every day. If you skip one day, it is easy to skip the next one. 
And if you do it every day, it becomes a habit. Now the PWD can start with say five to 10 minutes and then gradually increase the time. Sometimes a routine for 30 minutes is also easier to establish. But if a person has been very inactive in the past, you don't want to do too much too soon and risk injury. So this can differ from person to person. I've also seen individuals exercising in the wheelchairs, just slight arm motions, some light body weights, upper arm exercises, it really helps to sleep better. Exercising later in the day also helps to reduce a tendency for napping during the daytime and increases sleep drive or need for sleep at night. Try to make it fun. Are there any exercise buddies in your family or circle of neighbors or friends who can walk with the PWD? It is actually easier to stick with an exercise routine if you're not the only one who is doing with the PWD. And as we know, it can get boring. So mix it up. Walking is the easiest exercise for most people, but you can do different kinds of activities too. So for example, water exercise, riding a stationary bike, or even a ballroom dancing. And don't forget the safety tips during exercise. It is really important. Try to watch out for what the weather is like. Make sure you're wearing proper footwear. And if the PW doesn't want to exercise, try to find out why. If the PWD doesn't like an exercise, try to figure out an alternative. Make sure that there is no health related or any other kind of injury restriction which prevents them to exercise. So it is really important to keep the PWD in mind while establishing a routine. In addition to exercise, light also has impact on sleep. Light is an important factor in setting our circadian clocks and can impact sleep patterns. For example, uh, having lots of light in the morning is going to make your body want to go to bed earlier at night and having more light late in the day will tend to make your body want to go to bed later. Now we have found through research that exposure to bright light can also help PWD sleep more soundly. Now bright light does not necessarily mean being out in the direct sun. It could also be like sitting near a window on a sunny day. It can mean being outside even on a cloudy day because the kind of light that actually is good for the sleep reaches through the clouds. You can discuss with your loved one, the PWD to see if you know, he or she needs to increase the daily exposure to light. And we need to understand that some of the possibilities may differ across different individuals. Some may work, some may not. So some possibilities could be, for example, moving a favorite reading chair or breakfast table near the window, making a ritual of going out on the porch or deck for tea of certain time of a day, walking throughout the day when the sun is out, opening curtains in the house. Some people may also find that a bright light box, which is turned on near the chair while they read, watch TV or eat, is an easy way to get additional light exposure. Now these light boxes are the kind used in indoor garden shops and since they do not emit UV light that can cause sunburns, they are safe. Halogen lights should not be used because they can get hot and cause a fire risk. Research has shown that getting a minimum of 30 to 60 minutes of bright or natural outside light each day is ideal for helping sleep. It can also improve your mood. If you're able to spend time getting additional light exposure during the next few weeks, you should record this exposure in your log. Again, similar to exercise, even with light, we should be aware of some of the safety issues while being exposed to bright light. Some of the common safety issues are wear sunscreen whenever we are, you are outside. Try to be aware of the medications that can increase sensitivity to light. Drink lots of fluids. Now some PWD may not like bright light and can get agitated. So be aware of those. And in addition to increasing light during the day, it is also important to reduce the amount of light that PWD is exposed to at night. Some PWDs may become very sensitive to any light shining in the, 
I mean, in from the street outside or from cars driving by or even from the overhead smoke detector and it'll wake them up. So although PWDs need enough light in sleeping areas to be able to find their way to the bathroom and move about safely at night, it is better to use a small light lamp rather than to turn on an overhead light if he or she needs to get up. As we are educating the PWD about sleep patterns, what really helps them to sleep better, whether it's exercise, light, or consistent bed and rising time, or reducing nap times, it is important to note all these changes in a log. So this specific slide is an example of a sleep diary where the caregiver can actually maintain the different strategies that are being used by the PWD to sleep better. You can also use this log when you're meeting with the specialist and discuss any concerns that the PWD is encountering. Maintaining a good sleep hygiene can also help a PWD sleep better. This slide illustrates some example that a PWD can use in order to develop a good sleep hygiene. For example, try and do your exercise in the late afternoon. This will make you feel tired and will also prevent napping. The most important one, which I always suggest, is electronics should not be in the bedroom, whether it's a phone or a tablet or even watching TV. In the next part of my presentation, I'm going to discuss the results of a caregiver sleep study, which was funded by Retirement Research Foundation and implemented through Nova Southeastern University. But before I discuss the results of the sleep study, I would like to talk about one of the potential participants of the sleep study. Names in the case study have been changed. Cynthia, 75 years of age, had been living with her 83-year-old partner, George, for 30 years. She was the primary caregiver for George, who has moderate dementia. Cynthia was willing to make numerous attempts to help her partner deal with daily challenges of dementia. According to Cynthia, George experienced numerous sleep disturbances, including nighttime wandering and pacing, multiple awakenings, and difficulty falling asleep. Cynthia enrolled in the sleep study program in order to learn strategies to help reduce George's sleep disturbances. Typical of many caregivers, pre-testing of caregiver burden and depression suggests that Cynthia was significantly burdened by her caregiving role and may be suffering from major depression. Unfortunately, before starting the study, Cynthia called the study team and withdrew her participation in the study. When I spoke to her, she told me what happened. The night before, George, under the influence of alcohol, had grabbed her by the neck and attempted to choke her. Cynthia was able to save herself by distracting George, throwing a nearby flower vase, running outside the house and calling for the police. George was hospitalized. He begged for forgiveness. However, Cynthia could not continue to risk her life by living with her partner even though she loves him tremendously. Stories like these have informed us about the challenges of caregivers of persons with dementia and have provided important insights into designing community-based programs for PWDs and caregivers of PWDs. Cynthia's story is one of the many stories which prevents caregiver to participate in any educational training program. Our six-week caregiver training program was a pilot study, and we enrolled seven caregivers whose loved ones were diagnosed with dementia. Each caregiver went through a curriculum which was designed by the sleep study team. The caregivers were provided multiple survey instruments during the pre-test, and they were also provided the same survey instruments during the post-test to measure any change which was the effect of the study program. During the pretest, six out of seven caregivers had depression scores which suggested a possibility for major depression. Caregiver burden was also measured and five out of seven participants scored moderate to severe caregiver burden during the pretest. 
sleep problems, which were measured through the sleep disorder inventory, were also reported to be high during the pre-test. During the post-test, three of the subjects had reduced depression scores, suggesting some improvement. Only one patient had improvement in the score at the post-assessment. There was definitely a reduced frequency, severity, and distress associated with sleep. Now, since our N is small, so we really cannot say that the results during the post-test were based on the caregiver sleep training program. However, we did find that these experiences, which we discussed during the six-week training program, were very unique to each individual. Our discussions about sleep problems also help the caregivers provide mutual support, comfort, and brainstorming some ideas, which can help the PWD, particular unique sleep problem. Now, definitely longitudinal studies are required to test the efficacy of the caregiver training program. If you need more information about the educational intervention and strategies about the sleep study, please refer to a sleep manual, which is actually up, uploaded on the GWEP website, which is a Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program website. Thank you for listening to the presentation. And if you have any questions or feedback, please scan the QR code and enter your responses. You can also access the red cap link directly and complete the survey there. Thank you once again.